All right, let's go ahead and get started. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> that's horrible. All right, all right. Hey, yo. 2004. Yeah, okay, that's all. You remember. Well, I always get the year wrong for when you started here, so. Yeah. All right, welcome, everyone. I am uh, thrilled to introduce uh, Professor Galen McKinley. Uh, uh, Galen and uh, I. We went through, did we go through tenure together? I, I think we think did. So, yes, yes. Anker would know the details of it. I think you, me, and, and Anker about the same time. Yeah. Um, but we were hired right around the same time, uh, and then you had a postdoc, so I think I started a year before you. So, right. Galen uh, began as a professor here after, well, so got uh, her uh, degrees uh, from Princeton. No, 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 no. M MIT, right. what am I thinking? Yeah. Okay, so let me just clarify. Post office Princeton. Post office yeah. Princeton. We can tag team this day. Yeah, that'd be good. Because to, to be clear, uh, I learned that I was giving the introduction here. Uh, I should have dumped this on you. 15 I mean, at this seconds point, ago. This point, I probably would have done a better job than you did. That's right. So, uh, Hannah would have done a better job than I Because I can read. <laughs> and then went on to do a postdoc with Jorge Sarmiento. Mm -hmm. At Princeton. Yeah, yes, yeah, okay. gotcha. Um, and then uh, came here. Uh, no, then went to uh, uh, Mexico City. Mexico yeah. City to do climate impacts for yeah, a while. That's right. Yeah. And then came back and then joined us here at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, Gillen is the first woman to be granted tenure in the Department of Atmosphere and Oceanic Sciences at the University of Wisconsin. <laughs> Pioneer, in our, as well as full professor uh, in our department. So. Uh, and then in uh, 2017, moved on to uh, grayer pastures, New York being much grayer, <laughs> although right now maybe it's, it's comparable, uh, in, in Columbia University, where it, she had an uh, awesome opportunity to uh, join the Lont, uh, uh, Lont Dory, uh and Columbia University. So I, I'm thrilled to, to have had a chance to talk to you this morning and have uh, see what you've been up to over the last uh, several years, and we're all thrilled to have you. Welcome home. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, uh, everyone, for being here. It has really been a trip down uh, memory lane to come back to AOS. Uh, and some things uh, look very much the same, but so many things look different. Uh, it's great to see the growth of the department, uh, all the new assistant professors, all the new interest in oceanography. Um, <laughs> and um, I am really happy to, uh, to be able to share with you some of the work that I've been doing in the few years since I left. Um, and um, uh, you know, uh, maybe we can even start some new collaborations along the way. So um, I am going to be uh, talking about uh, using uh, uh, machine learning models and data to better understand how the ocean carbon sink uh, works. And uh, before I get started, I want to, um, uh, of course, thank the people who actually do the work, my research group, uh, students, postdoc. Um, the goal, oh wait, I didn't turn on the, Sorry, uh, AB. Green is good. Maybe you can hear me now better in the back, okay? Yep. Um, so um, the goal of our research uh, group is to understand the mechanisms of the global ocean carbon sink, uh, and uh, both in the uh, modern, um, modern uh, like recent past from data and also uh, in with using models. Um, and um, so we use models of the ocean and climate uh, and machine learning on sparse ocean data, both of which I'll be talking about here. And we have several collaborators around the country. Uh, and I also wanted to mention a center that I'm involved with running. I'm the deputy director of uh, a science technology center called LEAP, which is Learning the Earth with Artificial Intelligence and Physics. And the goal is to really uh, increase the, um, well, we have our mission statement there, but our goal is to really improve climate science and climate modeling by finding different ways to bring machine learning and big data into our models. Uh, so we're working in, in all of the areas of geoscience uh, and also in data science. Uh, we're uh, working ultimately to really focus on the community or system model to improve uh, the skill and to address some longstanding biases in CSM, uh, also doing parameter estimation to try to improve the uh, the speed at which one can develop a new model. Uh, we're also working on uh, bi-directional knowledge transfer with corporate partners and um, uh, in, ed in education really um, uh, underlies a lot of this on both sides here. 
working on broadening participation, and we're also working on um, building um, cloud um, uh, uh, platforms for data analysis, particularly right now working with uh, CMIT models, getting all of those up on the cloud so that people can just log into a browser, open a Jupyter Notebook, and do analysis uh, and grab all the models without having to download them. Uh, and so um, uh, that is a, 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 a resource we're trying to grow uh, and uh, move ourselves to the 21st um, century uh, <laughs> approach to doing science. So anyways, uh, we often have postdocs available uh, through LEAP in various areas. So if you're interested in how uh, you might uh, broaden your climate science, if you're interested in coming to New York City, uh, please look us up. And uh, uh, there's uh, going to be a lot of opportunities. This is a, a center is funded through 2026 right now, but we have a good uh, likelihood of being uh, getting another five years. So hopefully we'll be around for 10 years uh, and hopefully lots of collaborations and, and people can go through our Okay, so um, <clears throat> so um, my research uh, now, um, my work is really focused on understanding the ocean uh, as and its role in the global carbon budget. Uh, this is uh, the, um, the uh, global carbon budget uh, image from last year. I imagine most many of you have seen this every year. The global carbon budget puts out uh, right before the UNFCCC COPS puts out its analysis of where the carbon has come from in terms of emissions uh, from fossil fuels, from land use, and then where that carbon has gone in uh, the atmosphere, in the land, and in the ocean. And then they also, in recent years, have been able to assess uh, using this dashed red line here, which is the, simply the projection of the sources down uh, to the sinks. They should be balanced, so the magnitude of these uncertainties is an indicator of these um, the imbalance there is an indicator of our inability to uh, uh, close the global carbon budget, our uncertainty and our ability to estimate uh, emissions and uh, particularly the sinks. And so the ocean plays a really key role here uh, in uh, being a key place where the carbon that we're emitting goes on an annual basis. But actually, if we integrate this up over the industrial era from 1850 to 2021, uh, and now we're plotting this as, as, as the integral, we see that the fossil source is here, the land use source is here, and the land sink uh, integrated is actually about balanced uh, quantitatively with the land use source. So it's really only the ocean where on net uh, fossil carbon resides um, after uh, our, our history of land use being a major source, particularly through 1950. So the ocean is both the, the only cumulative source, uh, sink for carbon and also uh, and going forward is where on thousands of year time scales about 80% um, 80, 80 or so at least of our fossil, our fossil carbon will end up. So understanding the ocean carbon sink is really important part of understanding where climate change is going. And so uh, my, my research has, has always really been on trying to understand the, that global ocean sink, how it works, how it's changing, um, and how we can make better predictions. So uh, how does the ocean accomplish that climate service? Uh, and, and this is a diagram that we came up with. It's really trying to uh, schematize the two key components of the uh, ocean uh, carbon uh, cycle. So we have uh, a total carbon uh, uh, sink or, or fluxes that are the sum of natural fluxes and an anthropogenic component. Uh, with the natural carbon part being uh, uh, something that we believe was in approximately global steady state in the Holocene prior to the industrial era. In other words, big source regions were balanced out by sink regions, sources typically um, on this plot in the uh, lower latitudes and sinks at high latitudes. And, uh, and then also the chemistry of carbon in water that actually allows carbon to hold a, a, quite a lot of carbon. So this is in millimoles per meter cubed, about 2,000 millimoles per meter cubed uh, of carbon in water because carbon dissociates into ions and allows uh, the water to hold a lot, uh, quite a lot of carbon. Um, and so the, on the natural side, we have the biological pump that is um, removing carbon from, the, uh, from the, the inorganic carbon from the water, making organic matter, sinking it down into the ocean, and then the overturning circulation that is slowly uh, bringing um, the, the high carbon waters that get back to the surface. 
The net effect here is this dark line in terms of a global mean profile where we have less carbon in the surface ocean and more in the deep ocean because of that biological pump. Though it's slow, it happens uh, uh, continuously and the overturning has a time scale of about a thousand years and so in the end we're able to accumulate carbon in the deep ocean. That, that profile can be contrasted to the anthropogenic carbon uh, in the ocean, which is really just um, the essentially Henry's law operating at the global scale. We're adding carbon to the headspace above the ocean, adding carbon to the atmosphere. This, is, this goes up over time, and that carbon is slowly being pushed into the ocean simply by the fact that the partial pressure in the atmosphere is going up. And that uh, profile is opposite to the natural. It's at its highest in the surface ocean, and uh, the overturning circulation is slowly moving that anomaly into the deep ocean. Uh, so when we think about quantifying the ocean carbon sink, one of the things that we really need to do is look through all a, a very vigorous cycle over here. Uh, and I, I didn't mention that the, the total magnitude here is about 2,000. The total magnitude here at the surface is only about 70 millimoles per meter cubed. So the challenge really is a needle in the haystack kind of problem. These anomalies are quite small in terms of this natural background, as is true in many geophysical uh, situations. And we're trying to understand this critical car uh, climate service that's really happening over here in the context of this large background. And I forgot to say it at the beginning, but if you do have questions, please raise your hand uh, in the, along the way. I'm happy to clarify things. Uh, and uh, so please. Uh, Please just, uh, just speak up and stop me if I get too excited and I don't see your hand. So. <laughs> All right, so how then in the context of this situation do we quantify the ocean carbon sink? We really have three uh, key ways that we uh, constrain the ocean carbon sink. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step through those three uh, in a little more detail, but first I'll show you them. One is through interior carbon observations where we go out on a ship and we put instruments over the side, we collect water, do high quality observations, and map out, for example, here along this dashed line in the Atlantic, map out the, the whole structure of uh, dissolved inorganic carbon in the ocean. Um, and then we can combine those observations of DIC and oxygen and other tracers to make an estimate of how much excess carbon is in the ocean due to anthropogenic activity. We can also use numerical models. So this is a model that my group is, is, uh, is uh, working on, where we have a regional ocean model here, coupled in by geochemical processes. And here the model um, is estimating air sea fluxes. Um, uh, and uh, we can then use the model to evaluate the mechanisms. Um, and of course, not so much a regional model, but when we turn this into a global model and a climate model, we can make projections. Yeah. Yeah. What influences the magnitude of the ASC fluxes? Ooh. Is it seasonally dependent? It is definitely seasonally dependent. This is the bumps here shown. Uh, I have a few slides on that in a moment, but basically, it's um, in, in the um, in the in the uh, as we go into here, we're mixing up carbon. Then we have a lot of biological productivity happening in the in the. Um, in the summertime, uh, drawing carbon down, and then we have um, uh, that biological productivity in the northern Atlantic ceases because the nutrients get all used up, and then the warming of the ocean tends to raise the, the PCO2 in the um, in the winter time. So okay. yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of seasonality uh, in addition to the, the large scale fluxes. Okay, and then the last um, uh, way that I will mention also is to use uh, sparse observations uh, of partial pressure of CO2 in the surface ocean, and then take those sparse data, use machine learning to fill in all the gaps, and then estimate fluxes uh, from, uh, from data um, by filling in the gaps, not so necessarily mechanistically uh, with the equations of motion as you would in the case of a model, but more just statistically over there. So let me step through those three a bit more um, to give you a, a background on how we estimate the ocean carbon uh, update. So the interior observations. Um, so here, um, uh, the, the, the challenge on the interior observation side is that to go out on a research ship and spend uh, maybe two or three months going from uh, Iceland down to Antarctica um, is very expensive. And we can only afford to do these transects um, on the order of every decade in the, in the global ocean. Um, and so uh, we, we can 
gather these very high quality data taken from bottle samples that are actually collected at these depths directly so you actually have the water and you can do all the chemical analysis you want on the ship. But we can see these observations very frequently. Uh, but they do allow us, when we have the observations and stitch them all together, uh, and we can make um, a map such as this of, this is the column inventory of anthropogenic carbon, so it's the sum from surface to depth of all of the additional carbon that's in the ocean only do, only, that would only be there because of human activities. So we can see this bullseye of excess anthropogenic carbon there in the, in the North Atlantic, also in the sub-Antarctic low waters. And we can see, for example, the fact that because the waters of the deep North, and North Pacific are very old, they don't have a lot of anthropogenic carbon in them. If we look at this in sections in the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian, we see that most of the anthropogenic carbon is in the, is in the thermocline and basically zero is in the deep ocean. Yes. So what's the reason, uh, you know, on the Indian uh, Atlantic sector, the ocean Atlantic Arctic is much larger in the Southern Ocean than the Pacific sector? Uh, so it, oh, no, actually, so here, on the, 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 on then they're absorbing carbon while they're in the surface, and then they're being subducted into the mode water regions, right, after they've absorbed the carbon. While here we have uh, basically more the overturning circulation, where all this water, water moving north has absorbed carbon as it is going down in the deep ocean. If you actually look on these sections, the Atlantic section goes to 4,000 meters, the other ones only go to 2,000 meters. And we can see this tongue, this is what, the, this, this is the same data really. Uh, it, the, the, the overturning is bringing that carbon into the deep ocean. So, but from these data, there are certainly, of course, uncertainties in all these. Still, we can make an estimate, a pretty high quality estimate, of how much carbon is in the ocean only due to human activities. And that's where we get these uh, kind of 40% of all the emitted fossil, or a quantity equivalent to 40% of the emitted fossil carbon is, is in the ocean. Um, but we can only do this on decadal time scales. And as I showed you before, um, we really want to have uh, an estimate that, that is every year, not just the decadal uh, uh, numbers. Uh, of course, the decadal numbers are a very important uh, peg point here that helps us uh, kind of really close the global carbon budget quantitatively, uh, but it doesn't give us that interannual variability. It doesn't give us an ability to understand how things are evolving in real time. So for that, we turn to models, which of course, um, uh, you know, our, for, for people who might work with the weather model, are kind of a comparable uh, system, but now we've added equations that tell us about uh, the, the biological pump and the carbon chemistry. And so adding circulation together with carbon processes, we can get at air sea fluxes, right? Um, I'm sure many of you are involved with the, the challenge of, of building a model and analyzing it, but we definitely do that work for this problem as well. And then the, the third way is uh, to use surface observations and uh, then to extrapolate them. So if we want to get the CO2 flux, uh, why would we observe uh, the, the PCO2? Um, that, is, that is our main observable. And the reason is because when we look at the equation of the air sea CO2 flux, we have some gas exchange speed. We need to take into account the amount of ice. But really, it is the delta PCO2, the difference between the ocean and the atmosphere of PCO2, that drives the air-sea exchange. And our, the sign convention we use is um, a negative flux is into the ocean and positive is into the atmosphere. Um, and so, um, so, so, so a negative delta PCO2 is into the ocean. And if we look at these maps of, of, from observations, you can see that in the region, where, the, um, where we have outgassing, that's because the PCO2 here is higher than the atmospheric value, which is, which is there. And the region where the carbon's going, where we have blue, carbon uptake by the ocean, is where the PCO2 is lower uh, than atmospheric. Um, so we need to map out this field of PCO2 and then estimate the fluxes. Um, and of course, the atmosphere is, um, is much more uh, uh, well mixed, much more rapidly mixed than the ocean. So really, this is what we need to observe. So we do have, uh, actually, uh, with uh, 
efforts started at Le Mans long ago, uh, um, uh, the ability to put on a container ship or a research ship automated instruments that allow you allow for observations of the PCO2 along a ship track in a relatively automated way. Um, uh, with only every couple months a technician needs to go check on the instrument when it's in port. So um, these data started being collected in the 50s, but really became more numerous in the, the 80s and 90s. And we've now built up uh, this kind of a, um, uh, a database. Of, these are all the points in that database. You can see some regions are much more observed, such as the North Pacific and the North Atlantic, and then there's other regions where we just don't have a lot of ship traffic, uh, so there's not a lot of data. So you can tell from this that the data is clearly not evenly um, distributed. But in ships, fact, yeah, do ships not go to Vietnam and India, or is it um, just recently? Well, it's not just that the ships have to go there, it's also that they're, it, well, most of these are research projects. Oh, so somebody okay. has to have a relationship with the ship operator. Okay. In or, yeah. So I it, thought it was There emerging. are many more ships than this, but yeah, it's, the, okay. it's all for the relationships. Sorry. A lot of these lines here are, are more likely hydrographic research, research, yeah. But the reality is the actual data looks something more like this, okay, because this is all the data. And this is like one month, and this is actually June of 2016, which wasn't too bad, right? Um, but you can see how many data we actually get from any one month. And what we want are full coverage fields with which we can estimate not only the annual air sea flux, but also the month to month air sea flux, right? So clearly, optimal interpolation is really not going to work here, right? Um, but um, uh, people who worked on this uh, starting about 10 years ago realized that we do have full coverage data sets that are related to PCO2, such as chlorophyll <laughs> from satellite, such as sea surface temperature from satellite. Um, and, uh, and, and these there are, uh, these are at least, we have some like physical ideas of why these might be related to PCO2, um, such as by uh, the biological pump, by solubility, the, the temperature changes. And then people uh, realize that if we take um, these data, and build uh, and, and sort of set up a, in some cases a neural net and other, other kind of machine learning algorithms that can learn all these relationships between the driver data and the target data, target variable, what you're trying to predict, you can build an algorithm that's, that, based on the sparse data you have, that allows you to predict PCO2 um, based on the full coverage, temperature, salinity, mixer depth, et cetera, data. Then you can calculate the flux from that PCO2 and get to your CO2 fluxes. So, uh, uh, and I, I imagine some of you might be very skeptical about this approach given the sparsity of the data. And I will say I was very skeptical about this. And the, the first project that I'll tell you about in a minute was my effort to prove that this could never work. Right? And uh, of course, that's not what I found. But anyways. <laughs> So, but still, this, um, so anyways, the first look here is that if we look uh, at some recent data of these observationally based products in, in the blue with the uncertainty bounds and, and a suite of hindcast models in the green, even though there is a large spread, this is the global ocean sink here, um, we can see that there's still some correlation between these two, uh, these two mean estimates from a suite of both approaches, right? So there's something that these, these approaches are telling us, that the ocean carbon sink sort of um, got uh, bigger in the early 90s and was relatively on the whole, kind of constant or maybe declining a bit over the 1990s and then recovered, okay? So there is some information here, uh, and we are at least um, having, you know, the, the correlation between these two are something like 0.85 or something like that. So there is some agreement. Uh, and so, um, so we were not at this point maybe five years ago. We had totally different estimates. So at least we have two, two estimates here. But still, I want to ask this question. The PCO data are so sparse, can those products give us a, flu a robust flux estimate? Right? I was very skeptical that, that you could really just interpolate this and, and get something that was meaningful. And so um, how would you test that, right? We're never going to actually go out into the ocean in June of 2016 in the South Pacific and know what the PCO2 was, right? 
But as my, uh, I think I probably learned from the folks here in SSEC, for example, who do the kind of uh, observing system simulation experiment, that we actually have models, right? We have uh, ocean and climate models that give us full field PCO2 estimates, right? Now, they're, they're certainly not perfect. There's errors in them. But we have full coverage fields. Uh, we have, and we also have multiple climate models. We use four large ensembles in this case. We have multiple climate models that give us an estimate of PCO2, an estimate of sea surface temperature, and an estimate of mixed layer depth. And so we said, well, we know none of them are perfect, so let's use a bunch. Um, let's do 25 members times four models. 100 members seem like a nice round number. And let's take each of those members, sample them as the observations, do our uh, neural network. Um, this, in this case, we're working with Peter Landschutzer using his reconstruction and then make our, our, our reconstruction. And the value here is that because we're in model world, we know the right answer, right? And we can make a comparison between what we reconstructed and what the known truth is, and we can do that for a whole bunch of different time scales uh, and um, at every point in space, right? So we can get an idea of how well this reconstruction approach works. Now, we're, we're not trying to estimate the real PCO2 here. We're just trying to say that if we have this much data, and we use this approach, could this possibly be something like the real thing? Or how close could it be? Yeah? Uh, I just have a question about your neural network. Yeah. Um, is that computing only a snapshot uh, and a uh, natural time, or is it using also previous time? It's, yeah, this, um, there is a, um, uh, a month of year variable in here. So there is, it knows about seasonality, and it also knows about like distance from the equator, for example. But, it does, it, but it, we are using all data to fill in uh, the, the current point, right? Where it's not just June data for June 2016 that's trying to fill in June, 20, uh, June of 2016. It's filling in using all the data. We're building a single algorithm for the whole globe, in fact, yeah. yeah other, some people have, I haven't seen it done month by month. I, some people have done it breaking it up more regionally and doing it regionally. But we're doing one algorithm for the whole globe. Okay, so um, so anyways, we can if we have our reconstruction and our, and our member, we can break it up into you know, D-trend, seasonal, decadal variability, subdecadal variability. You can look at all the time scales of interest. You can look at um, uh, bias. You can look at the phasing of seasonality. You can look at co correlation, right? Do I get the right amplitude um, uh, uh, or and the right phasing of the um, of the of the uh, of the results, like can my reconstruction do its job on these different terms? And this is work that was done by Lou Pluggy, who got his uh, master's here in AOS, and then moved with me to, to Columbia. And so um, uh, here is the result for the, the long-term uh, 1985 to 2016 mean, average over our 100 member ensemble. And uh, we find that the global bias is basically zero, so uh, unbiased. But certainly locally, and particularly in the Southern Ocean where the data are particularly sparse, we definitely get some much higher biases. But if we're interested in the large scale, um, uh, kind of uh, you know, tropical, northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, uh, the bias is actually quite low, uh, and, and surprisingly low, actually. If we look at the seasonality here, the yellows mean uh, the um, uh, the phasing of the seasonality has a correlation of 0.8 or greater, uh, and we get very high correlations for the seasonality at most locations, even in, in, in much of the southern uh, hemisphere, although certainly not everywhere. However, on the decadal phasing, it's much more challenging to reconstruct, and that makes sense to me. Is that you know we have we do have pretty very sparse data, and um, uh, but still we're capturing multiple seasonal realizations in the end, and so we're able to build those algorithms more successfully. If we look at the um, standard deviation, the amplitude of the variability, seasonally, um, again, we have some, some regions that don't work so great, particularly the poorly sampled Indian Ocean, but the northern hemisphere, the amplitude is uh, basically right on, uh, and in the southern hemisphere and the tropics as a whole, it's sort of modestly overestimated. 
But if we look at the decadal amplitude, we get a significant over, overestimation of the amplitude of the decadal variability in these products, right? So what we've learned from this result, from this, from this effort, is that some of the time scales seem to be pretty well, surprisingly well reconstructed by these approaches, even with such limited sampling. But the cable variability is probably not adequately sampled um, to get um, to get a really uh, robust reconstruction. We need to be careful about conclusions about decadal variability out of these products. And going back to this plot, I'll just note that if we um, had lesser decadal variability in the observationally based products, basically flattening this curve, it would look less divergent from the mean of the models, right? So it would at least take us uh, into a closer agreement with the other major approach that we have to making these estimates. But we don't still know what the truth is, so more work to be done. Uh, but uh, um, I, I think we have learned, we've done, made some improvement uh, over just saying, well, we have these uh, database products and we don't really know how good they are, right? Try to make some progress. Um, and, uh, and there's uh, actually a lot of work on the observationally based products now is trying to kind of unpack more those uncertainties using the model sampling approach and using others. Other yeah, John. Can you use that same technique to um, investigate the weak spots that you suspect are in the model? Ah, yes. Did you? I don't think I planted that question. But, uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> you don't know how good that makes me feel. <laughs> <laughs> we think alike. Yeah. <laughs> all right, I'll get on to that. So, um, all right. So, so um, uh, take home message one: We think the mean and seasonality can be robustly reconstructed from observation, but regional and decadal errors can be large. So I will, um, uh, yeah, I think this is, you know, do the ocean models also have a low bias? What can we learn about them is the next question we ask as a segue to trying to pull, to answer John's question, really. So here is, um, uh, this is just a sort of, to, show, to remind you of what I mean by a model, a, a dynamical simulation. Uh, here are global ocean models, so not quite the same thing. But these are the global ocean models that are in the global carbon budget. Uh, in 2021 in this case. And this is a Taylor diagram where we have uh, the standard deviation here and the correlations here. The data, these are independent data from model samples at the, at the surface ocean that are down here. So what we want, if the, if the data looked exactly, if the, if the model, sorry, looked exactly like the data, would have a correlation of one and have exactly the right amount of standard deviation. So the further away you are from the star, the worse you're doing, right? And so what this is just sort of a way of looking at a lot of data at once, saying that the global ocean models are not so great at capturing the independent data, right? A correlation of maybe 0.6 and tend to overestimate the, the, the standard deviation of those observations. Um, so the models, and, and there's other work that we've done and others have done that show that there are a lot of biases in these models. Uh, and so, um, you know, the models also have their issues. So if I've shown you that the products can capture mean and seasonality, uh, but certainly errors remain, and the ocean models are based on theory and process understanding that it certainly has utility, but they still have substantial errors, can we use both to make a best estimate of the ARC CO2 fluxes? Can we combine their strengths? And that's what we've done with um, this product, um, the LDO hybrid physics data product uh, that we've published a couple papers on in the last, in the last year. <coughs> So in this approach, what we have is we have the global carbon budget models, eight or nine of them, depending on the paper, as our prior. So that prediction in a high gas model is our first estimate. And then instead of directly reconstructing the PCO2 based on the data, we're reconstructing a misfit between the models and the data. So we're saying at every point when we have a data, calculate how, mo how different the model is from that and then use uh, observed temperature salinity chlorophyll to estimate a full field correction so that you can then apply to your model um, and, and, and then uh, do this for several models average to get your final PCO2. So that's also shown schematically here. Our algorithm is uh, calculating an error and then we're adding back uh, the full field to actually make the estimate of the PCO2. Okay. And so it is actually these model data misfits that is the answer to John's uh, question um, that I'll show you, yeah, show you right here. So if we calculate a misfit of two different models in two different seasons, uh, 
to the data, we see very different um, results between the MPI and the CRM model. For example, in DJF, MPI needs huge positive corrections in the Southern Ocean, while CNRM needs kind of modest negative corrections in the same place, right? So we have this uh, now a full field estimate of where the model is wrong, again, based on that very sparse data. Um, and, um, and we are starting a new project, actually, where we're more trying to use these patterns um, as a, and trying to say, well, how much of this how similar is this to the SST errors, to the mixed layer depth errors, to the other errors as a way of diagnosing a model and trying to understand what's going wrong in, wrong in this climatology. Um, because uh, you know, we have full, we, you know, we have other ways, other variables with full spatial resolution that we might learn something about. But we, we haven't made much progress in the actually of app applying of them, but we are trying. So yeah. Um, okay. So Okay, so that, um, so now, uh, so I calculate the misfits. I'm now gonna correct my models and average to get my final PCO2. And now I have this blue line here is my interannually corrected um, uh, LDO HPD product uh, in the dark blue. I'm comparing it uh, for, to the original models from which it came. And you can see um, the, the spread of those models. You can see that on the whole, we get more variability in uh, the uh, product uh, compared to those models. Um, and um, uh, uh, yeah, so, so, right, okay. So, and then if I do this, I look at these uh, Taylor diagrams here. Again, here are my ocean models. I see that the, these data products are actually much closer to independent data that did not go into the building of those products. Then this is our result. And these are some of those other data products that were on the previous slide. Uh, previous slide. So we're, we're doing modestly better than the other products, which is, of course, good. But it's certainly modest, right? I mean, the difference between 0.82 and 0.87 correlation you know, um, is, is not huge. Uh, but still, we've gotten kind of a modest improvement there, um, uh, uh, which is you know, certainly better than nothing in our, in our game. But I really would like to understand uh, from where that enhanced skill arises, right? What, what, what led to that? Um, and what more can we learn about what's going on here? And so we began to look more at these misfits uh, in, in detail. And what we learned from that analysis is that if we look here at the Princeton model, as an example, this is the climatology of the Princeton model for those misfits. And then this is the standard deviation of the interannual correction after you remove the, the seasonality. And uh, the key thing I wanted to note is that the scale here for the climatological misfit is negative 100 to 100. And the scale here is just to 25, okay? So the magnitude of these corrections is almost everywhere significantly larger for the climatology than for the interannual variability, with some exception in the equatorial Pacific and in the high latitude um, uh, and, and Antarctic, but even in like the North Atlantic, pretty much uh, the magnitude of the seasonal correction is the dominant thing, right? So the climatology is the problem. I was talking to Dan, he was like, yeah, I knew that, I knew that. Uh, but uh, we, were, <laughs> we were happy to see this. <laughs> um, and, um, and so um, the uh, uh, interesting thing is that if I now say, well, okay, I, I, the climatology is a bit so this, most of the story, how much bang can I get out of the buck, right? So what if I make a different reconstruction that only applies that climatology for as the correction over this period? And now I go back to my Taylor diagram and say, how much, uh, how much better did I do? What I find is that the climatological correction gets me from here to here, right? So the most of the improvement is actually in the climatological correction, uh, not in, <coughs> the, this is the delta for the interannual correction. Uh, and here's the, here's the time series uh, of the, uh, the one where I corrected it only with the climatology, right? So, um, it, it, so but, but I think, uh, so this just shows you the, the global mean time series, but I think this is the most interesting plot here, showing you that the improvement is mostly coming from the improvement of the climatology in those models. Um, and so, uh, and, and so, and, and then the nice thing, referring back to the previous work, is that we actually have some evidence from our test bed work that the climatology of these products actually can be relatively uh, 
um, you know, it can be relatively robust too, right? So we think the data is sufficient to constrain that climatology as well, right? So those two pieces are working together here. So knowing that, um, we decided, well, what if we decided now we wanted to go back in time? Because we don't have direct observations, enough direct observations to calculate our interannual misfits in the 1960 to 82 period. But we do have those climat the climatological misfit uh, from, the, from the, this later period that we can apply back here. So that means we can build a data product that goes all the way back to 59 here. Uh, by extending the um, climatological correction in the pre-observed period and using the interannually varying correction in the post-observed period. Yeah. So to be clear what you're doing here is you're just taking a, you're debiasing the historical climatology with leaving the model interannual variability in. Yes. And using that as your predictor in your machine learning model. Uh, let me restate it. What we're doing is we're calculating in the period in which we have observations, yeah. calculating the, the correction, making a climatology of that and just applying it to the models back here when we don't have uh, any direct data to make a correction. Always. Yeah, so we're sort of using, uh, yeah, and we actually use the average of uh, 2000 to, 2020, uh, to 2020 climatology because that's when we have the most oh, observation. You're, yeah. So you're just correcting the, the, the PC2. Yeah, we're just correcting. The result of all this guy. We're, sorry. I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. as you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah, we're just correcting the PCO2 field, yeah. yeah. Uh, but but, the, but we do uh, we do want to be clear that based on just the core, the comparison between this interannual co correction and the climatological correction, we are probably, un, uh, you know, getting a better estimate of the variability, of course, in the period we, we can make those interannual corrections, right? So we probably have a damped variability back here compared to what actually occurred, right? But at least we have some estimate, um, uh, and we can here see it compared to the models, compared to other products. And in the time that we were publishing it, one other product actually was published that goes back to 59 as well. So now we have two products that um, uh, that are not as time constrained as the as the other set of products. By using different approaches. And then the, uh, I'm almost done. The, the nice thing about that is that then we can actually have a data set that we can analyze, okay? So now we have a data set not just for the 80s to the 2000s, but now we have a 60-year a data set, a monthly one-by-one one ARC, or a data estimate, I should say, one-by-one one ARC CO2 fluxes. And if I look here in the different basins, Pacific, Atlantic, Indian, and Southern, uh, these are detrended anomalies. We can see that there is sort of coherent variability where in the um, 60s and uh, 70s we had uh, a lesser uptake uh, in the equatorial Pacific, and that also you know, happened in the Southern Ocean. Then in the uh, 80s, 90s, we had this enhanced uh, uptake uh, and with El Nino's uh, strong in the Equatorial Pacific uh, and, and, and similar kind of sign of the anomalies happening in the Southern Ocean. And then uh, subsequent to about 2000, we had now uh, anomalies that are uh, positive or lesser uptake uh, relative to that long-term trend. Um, and then uh, we've also done some work uh, plotted here are the major volcanoes, uh, uh, Angon, El Chichan, and Mount Pinatubo. We've also worked on the potential for those to have an effect on air co 2 fluxes and also on ends of time. But I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. But we are working on understanding this coherent variations. Uh, my student, Suki Wong, who's graduating in a few months, is, uh, is writing up a paper on that work. So, um, uh, we, we're hopeful that we'll learn something new about the, the mechanisms as well. Uh, this this, this uh, transition has been long been a source of uh, questions in uh, ocean carbon sink. <laughs> Many science papers are done. Okay, so, um, so our new 59 to 2020 data product uses machine learning to leverage complementary strengths of models and PCO2 data and re reveals these coherent equatorial Pacific Southern Ocean decadal timescale oscillations uh, for, the, for the first time. So we're trying to understand those. And I guess I did have a few more slides that I wanted to share on looking forward. Okay, so how will the ocean carbon sink change in the future? So bear with me, I think I, I have a few more minutes. <laughs> All right, so the future ocean carbon sink. Uh, here is CMIP 6 um, uh, data. Uh, this is a paper that uh, just came out in uh, environmental research letters. Um, 
here we have uh, the future emissions under the different SSP scenarios, red being high, of course, blue being low, and then we have the ocean sink. Uh, and uh, mostly I'm gonna focus on CMIP, which is shown in the colors. We also looked at MAGIC, which is the integrated assessment model, a uh, simple, simple climate model used in the development of the scenarios themselves. Uh, and they do largely the same thing. So the first order look here is just to, to keep in your mind is that as emissions rise, the ocean takes up more and more carbon. But as emissions decline, the ocean more or less first order parallels that, right? Because the ocean sink is driven by Henry's law, essentially, we're adding all this carbon to the headspace, driving it into the ocean. If we drive less and less into the atmosphere by cutting our emissions, the ocean is going to stop being such an efficient sink, right? That's also going to reduce ocean acidification. Uh, and, uh, but, but we need to understand these changes uh, and be able to explain it to the people of the world so that we can keep people on track for, uh, for cutting the emissions um, and, and meeting climate targets. So the goal of this paper was to ask the question, you know, how robust are our future uh, um, uh, understanding of the sink and what might drive some of the uncertainties? So um, uh, uh, one of the things we did is you know, just sort of take the, the way we often do this, we look at the mean of our database estimates, we look at the, the model and say, okay, the first order, it looks okay, it's getting the large scale patterns. But if I actually do a zonal average of the data product shown in the black with the gray band, and then uh, the different models here shown in the colors, and these are ensemble mean uh, of multiple members, typically five to 10 members, you can see that there are many regions where the models, the, the CM6 models, are not even in the range of the available data products, uh, where they tend to estimate too much, but too little uptake in the subtropics, uh, too little outgassing in the equatorial zones, and be really all over the place in the Southern Ocean. Um, but but the, the key point we wanted to make with this paper is that these errors here really just stick with us all the way going forward. They don't really change. These errors are the real source of future uncertainty. So I show that here just for the, as this, the high emission scenario by, by, uh, with these plots where I'm looking here at the difference between 2050 to modern and the difference of 2090 to modern. The scale here is uh, one half the scale of over here. Okay, so this is 50 over here while this is 50 over here. And the point is just that the, the models all go in the same direction and are pretty consistent in terms of how they change in the future and are much more consistent <laughs> than they are in terms of the mean state. All right, so the, the future change, the models basically all tell us that in at 60 degrees south, if we follow SSP 585 by 2050, the ocean carbon sink will basically be you know, 35 pentagrams bigger than it is now. But those same models disagree wildly as to what the current sink is, right? And so the change is not where the uncertainty is. It's in the mean state. And then if I just look, in a similar, this is the one I showed you before, and then these are the other scenarios. It's consistent across the scenarios, okay? So the point we wanted to make with this work is just that if we could fix the mean state of our models, we have some evidence that we're gonna improve our ability to make accurate predictions going forward, uh, and that we also have these data products that we think can constrain the current, um, uh, the climatology, right? And so we should be using those as a target uh, in, in our development uh, <coughs> as a way to, to move our models into a better, a better place. Um, all right, so that's the last point I want to make. The future ocean carbon sink will change with atmospheric CO2 growth rate, but that the future spread is really dominated by modern mean state errors. Uh, um, and uh, so, yeah. That was what I wanted to share with you about the work I've been doing. Uh, I'm happy to take your questions. Uh, and if I don't get to your questions right now, happy to you know, send me an email and I'm happy to answer it at a later time too. So, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do you have questions first? Hi, uh, thanks for the great talk. So in the beginning you had a the plot with like the sources of carbon on top and then the things. Uh huh. And then the, you had the line protected. Yeah. How come there's some years where it looks like the budget is closed and then I guess there's something special about those years where you're able to close those? 
No, I think that's, I, mean, I think it's, I, I would say it's good that we're not always on one side of the line or the other, right? So it sort of suggests that when you integrate over decades, we're more or less balanced, right? But it is this interannual variability, particularly on the land side, that seems to be a big part of this uncertainty, right? The land is, the, is more interannually variable than the ocean, uh, but the ocean certainly can contribute uh, some of that. Um, uh, there also is some uncertainty in the emissions as well. But it's, it's really, we can't say what it is, right? We just know that we're not fully able to close the budget. We're getting better, right? This period is much worse than down, than down here. Uh, but the, uh, the one point I will make is that yeah, one of the biggest periods of uncertainty is actually with Mount Pinatubo's eruption. Um, and um, the, the land observations that I know some of you work with, like the flux towers and stuff, uh, the stuff that uh, Professor Desai's work uh, group often works on, uh, all of those kinds of observations didn't exist in 1992 when Pinatubo erupted. So we really didn't have a way to understand what happened on the land sink um, with the eruption of Mount Pinatubo. So I know a lot of land pre people who say, when we get another big eruption, then we'll figure out what happened back then, right? So uh, I, I do think that the volcanoes are an interesting place to think about uh, force responses um, and in the carbon side, um, we have a lot to learn about what happened with the, with the big volcanoes. And I think there also is some, some stuff going on in the ocean uh, to a smaller magnitude, probably about a 10, 15%. Uh, uh, but, um, but still, um, the ocean probably has some, some role to play there. Yeah, I have two questions. Uh, first one, when you use four uh, four models with 25 ensembles to uh, try to predict the observation or mm -hmm. simulate the observation, mm -hmm. does the neural network change when you have different model, like the numerical model resolution leading to them? So they're all, the models we use, these were all um, large ensembles all at one degree resolution. Um, so, e but each individual ensemble member gets its own uh, trained neural network. So we individually retraining the neural networks each time. Um, they, they are, um, the neural networks are more different when you move from, um, we actually found that all the ensembles in, that we did in CSM are pretty similar. All the ones in CAN ESM are pretty similar. So they're actually, there's a lot of dependence in the results actually on model, the underlying model, which I get, didn't necessarily uh, realize was gonna happen at the beginning, but there definitely is uh, dependence on the underlying structure. So that's why I do think it's good that we have four different kind of models. Um, so, uh, so yeah, yeah. Because I view the observation at the pinpoint, and uh, if you have one, one on one degree, Quite different from what you have in the observation. Yeah, so, so the, the, the data we're using are actually already uh, averaged up to one by one degree okay. resolution. Okay. So each of those one by one points, because it's a ship steaming through, taking data approximately every minute, tend to get um, many hundreds of points in each uh, one by one grid cell. But you're still, you have a grid cell and the ship is going through. I mean, there's no guarantee that it's going to be uh, fully representative. So that is an issue. And particularly if we now move to ha where we're using like floats, uh, Argo floats that might only come up once every 10 days, um, you can imagine even more of a problem of representativity at one by one degree, right? So that is something we'll, we'll have to worry about, particularly as we move to the autonomous observations that are definitely coming. Yeah? Now, I mentioned those simulated observations. Can you use those to inform where the next best ship track would be to, to correct our data? You could say yes. this route each year is the best way to, to, to go forward. Absolutely, and we, my postdoc, Taya, is actually working on that right now, right? So we're saying, and we did that a little bit in this paper, actually, too. We said, what if we had a whole bunch of flows in the Southern Ocean? How much better could we do? And we actually show that if we added a bunch of flows in the Southern Ocean, I don't have the slides here, but that we could almost fully resolve this decadal uh, variability issue, uh, and but still only with 5% sampling, right? So we are actually, actually, no, sorry, we went for like, um, we went from like 1.9% 1, 1 sampling only up to like 3% sampling of the global ocean. So we didn't have to fill the ocean with samples, right? And so this is definitely something we're continuing to work on, working with some people at NOAA who do sail drones and other things. Because when you're dealing with machine learning, you're not necessarily trying to fill in the physical space here, but it's the state space, right? The state space whereby SSD, salinity, chlorophyll are related to PCO2. And so it's possible that if we, if we can target you know, the wintertime data, 
um, uh, we could do a better job of filling in those algorithms. And, and these kinds of um, uh, um, test bed allow you to do some of that work in a, in a model instead of actually sending it, doing the expensive observation itself. So we're doing some of that. Yeah, the back there. Yeah, I just had a quick question for understanding. So you, you have two sources of bias that you showed one where you calculate your tracks in the model and you show the bias between like what your estimated PCO2 is and the actual PCO2 in the model. Mm -hmm. And then you have a bias between the tracks in the model versus the tracks in the observations. And I was a little confused about like when you're doing the bias correction, mm -hmm. which one of those are you correcting for? Yeah, okay, great, great question. I hope I can clarify. So in this work with the test bed, we are not using real data at all. We are only saying if we just sample the model as the observations, um, then we build a reconstruction. We know at every point what the answer should be. How well did we do? Right. So that's the 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 the. the, the and then this question of if we added more samples, how much better could we do? Is all done in this test bed world. When I go to the um, to the actual effort here to build a new data product. Now I am using real PCO2 data and a Hindcast model that it's not a climate model, it's a Hindcast model driven with real meteorology, trying to estimate, you know, and so what it really happened. And here I'm trying to say, my model is an estimate of what really happened, my data is the real thing, how can I correct the model towards the observation? So here it's all with real, um, real data in this case. Um, and it's more about now making the best estimate, and then when I look at these Taylor diagrams, now I have yet another source of data that's not feeding the algorithms as my independent comparison point. Yeah, hope that helps. Oh, okay. It's a question online. Oh, question online, okay. Uh, Liz asked, the issues of the decadal variability in the first half of the talk, could, could that be related to the models having an overestimate of SST response to external forcing relative to the magnitude of SST decadal variability? Um, you know, we really focused on this, not so much from a, um, what are the issues like in the models or something, more from a, there's not enough data to feed the algorithm, right? Because um, let's say, and, and honestly, some of these climate models we used here had uh, like MPI is a massive seasonal cycle in the Southern Ocean, huge, much bigger than the other models, for example. Uh, the question was, if I took, if I had that model, and if it were the real world, could this work, right? Uh, so we were really focused on, if I had this much data, I did this reconstruction, could I do this? And not really focused on analyzing what the, what the issues were in the model. Um, and then, as I said before, we, at, we, did, we found out that if we added some another percent of sampling, we could actually close those gaps. So it's more, this was more about the, the sampling as opposed to the, um, the what's really going on um, uh, questions. Uh, but now, now getting back to the, you know, I, I do think that if I look at the real data over here, or the, our estimate of the, of the real world, and look at these kinds of flux anomalies that we want to understand, now this is a database estimate, but uh, we would like the models to get this right, and then, you know, once we maybe understand from the observations, then we can ask why well, can or can the models do that, so. Yeah. Another question there, yeah? You actually answered the question. Okay. <laughs> Great, you and Liz were thinking the same thing. Yeah, John? Um, it strikes me that I think it was Hamish's question about trying to fill in gaps, and you made a really nice answer about you don't, and I think you knew, but you don't need to fill in all of the space in the physical latitude and longitude. It reminds me of, um, targeted observations that was about 15 or 20 years ago in the atmospheric side of the problem. And that involves, of course, adjoint sensitivities, a la Michael Morgan and Nuo and all. Does anybody use adjoint sensitivity work on some of this? You know, um, uh, the, I work a little bit with the people at the ECHO group who have built physical models. Mm. Uh, actually, our, and we are, this model that I'm building here, the ASTE model, uses the uh, adjoint in physics, and we're adding biotrude chemistry to that. Oh. Uh, but um, we have not gotten an adjoint for biotrude chemistry to work, right? Mm. Uh, we're doing a Green's function appro approach to try to tune some of the parameters, but we haven't gotten an adjoint to work. So. Doing a fully adjoint biogeochemical simulation, I, you know, Matt Mazov at, at, at Scripps has made some progress, but ultimately the challenge of that is essentially back to this. This biology 
is we don't have geostrophy for the biology, you know? We don't have Navier Stokes for that. We have like 20,000 phytoplankton species that we say, well, we'll call it two species, or maybe three or four. Uh, okay, yeah, and then yeah. you have to estimate some how, how much fast they grow, and based on some laboratory experiments, but most of them won't grow nicely in a lab, so you make an estimate based on the one that did. And, mm -hmm. and there's so much uh, uncertain about how this all works. I yeah. mean, our, that, that uh, I mean, Matt Maslow at, at Scripps is making some small progress, and that definitely this is a goal, yeah. but it's really hard. So is that a target for the next level of AI? Um, Where you really hit that hot and you come up with a beautiful spectrum and you can say, okay, this is a nice parameterization of this or something? Well, it, that would be nice, but one of the problems here is just that the data also doesn't oh, yeah, exist, no, right? Yeah. Because you have to go out in the yeah. global ocean, you know, in the ocean, yeah. and it's so variable. It's a real challenge. Yeah. yeah. But, but, but I think that's where that, that Coleman filtering, like what Greg Hagen was doing, that Coleman filtering would account for that. You don't need to fully resolve. You need some sort of a forward model that exists within whatever data you have, mm -hmm. and then you don't need to worry about well-balanced adjoints in that case. You can, you can do it. Yeah. You can you can do that sort of sensitivity analysis through it's the different time. Yeah, you mentioned that paper. Yeah. I should look it up. The only thing I worry about with that is that there may not be enough variability to actually to, 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 to there may not be enough data. Well, maybe the more recent record to, to actually constrain your errors. Maybe it doesn't matter because you still get estimates of influence functions from those. So. Well, I'll look it up. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? I'm saving mine for something. <laughs> yeah. All right, let's thank Galen one more time.